Welcome everyone. My name is Stephen and I'll be your moderator this evening. I'm very excited to welcome Eric Pook, president of Cirrus Consulting Group and Bob Gray, owner and partner of Gray Pilgrim and Associates as our speaker tonight. They'll be diving into the top tax saving strategies for tenants and owner occupied dentists alike. So just before we get started and hand over to them, I'd like to take a moment to go over a couple of points of basic housekeeping. Firstly, if you have a question at any point during this evening's presentation, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A section and we'll answer them live at the end. And secondly, Henry Schein is not offering C credit for viewing or attending this presentation. And that applies to whether you're watching this live or on demand. So with that, um, Eric, Bob, welcome. I'm going to pass it over onto the two of you now. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. Greatly appreciated. And uh, good evening, everybody. For those of you dialing in, we do have uh, some great content on screen. Don't zoom and drive, but we uh, appreciate it here. Eight o'clock on the East Coast and five on the West Coast. Uh, and looking forward, this is certainly one of our most highly requested courses. And quite frankly, I'm incredibly pleased we were able to secure Bob as a co-speaker for this evening. You're in uh, for a great piece of information, especially around tax time. I can't thank you enough, Bob. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Bob is a member of Gray Pilgrim and Associates, one of the partners there, which is a firm pretty unique, dedicated to improving the quality of life and income for dentists, because God knows you've all been through a lot over the past three years. Uh, Bob, though, for 30 years has assisted clients managing practices, improving financial success, planning for the future, and was also one of the founding members of the Academy of Dental CPA, uh, an actual group of accountants who specialize for dentists. Uh, so I've had the privilege of being a co-lecturer with Bob on many different types of courses, including Henry Schein's Central Business Institute, uh, as well as uh, being down in Napa together. And Bob, I really think we should have done this with a glass of wine. I think that really would have, you know, a nice glass of vino tinto or something. That would have been a better choice, yeah. <laughs> Well, we appreciate it. Bob, uh, maybe just to, to, again, kick things off, we'll do an intro poll, uh, which we can pull up now and help you to customize some of the content for this evening. Um, Bob, maybe what, what are you seeing a lot of now? I mean, you're right in the height of tax season. So again, can't thank you enough, but what are a lot of the questions, a lot of the mistakes you're seeing doctors make? What, what are you seeing now from your uh, CPA perspective? Yeah, we're gonna talk about a lot of that. I mean, a lot of the content tonight are the, it was born from the things that, I see mistakes that dentists make. So we're going to talk a lot about the QBI deduction. <clears throat> we're going to talk about you know whether or not to take Section 179. But you know, if, on a whole, I see that most uh, dental practices have really well rebounded from the pandemic, and so incomes are up. And it's a, it's a time when taxes are on the you know the forefront for all dentists. <laughs> Yeah, it's certainly an interesting time. We've seen the same. Uh, again, you'll have a quick poll up. Uh, just take a quick minute to update those, and we're happy to sort of customize. So a lot of questions about, you know, should I incorporate? Should I not incorporate? You know, how do I help? I own my building. How do I structure my lease? Um, what are some, you know, how do I pay myself rent, right? How much do I pay for rent, uh, as well as we've just found, quite frankly, a, a different perspective. Uh, if there's one thing that we've seen right now is that we've seen landlords, many of them, especially sort of the mid-sized or the smaller mom and pops that have a significant amount of debt or interest expense on them. Uh, now in these strip malls, suddenly no different than your residential mortgage, some of these uh, mortgages are coming up for renewal and suddenly there can be a substantive increase for those landlords. So unfortunately, some are taking it out on the, the nice dentist in terms of rental rates and when those are coming up for renewal. So yeah, we'll certainly touch on some key methods because God knows we've certainly spent enough time uh, dealing with lots of stress and challenges through COVID and now through all these, you know, incredible rising interest rates and inflation and beyond, beyond, beyond. So uh, just as a quick perspective here, Bob, just as we customize some of the content here. So roughly about 39% of the attendees own, 61% uh, are in a leasing situation. Uh, we have about sort of a a uh, quarter to a little less planning to open or relocate a practice, some looking to acquire a practice, uh, some 
but 30% are thinking of transitioning to selling their practice. Another 16% plan to stay put, renegotiate, file their taxes, get as much back as possible. Um, in terms of growth, this is an interesting one, Bob, especially for, for your section, is the uh, uh, roughly 53% are planning to invest 55% now, planning to invest in new technology and equipment. So especially as it pertains to looking at investments into the practice, as well as potentially another 15% renovating, another 15% planning to expand, another 20% thinking of relocating, 10% uh, not growing, uh, and beyond a uh, number of doctors with a month-to-month -month lease. We'll touch on that. Some of you, uh, roughly 30% with the lease it's due in the next two years, uh, and roughly about a quarter own their own building, Bob. Uh, so that's, uh, that's great. Okay. Yeah, so, I think we'll have a little bit of something for everyone tonight. No kidding. All right. So let's uh, thank you for that, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll start jumping in and uh, digging through a little bit deeper. So really, the purpose of tonight is, is all about you. Uh, is to how can we help to make sure that we're driving profitability? How do we help to minimize tax? God knows we've paid enough of it over the years, right? What are some of the top dental experts doing to help mitigate some of those taxes? Uh, relocations, oh, there's a lot of sort of topics of conversations, uh, some missed tax deductions. Bob uh, really has some great best practices on cost segregations, uh, and then really looking at some of the tax reasons why sellers want to sell goodwill, buyers want to buy equipment, and how do you find something that meets in the middle, depending on your perspective. And then obviously the lease, right? The lease is a big component. We see this all too often, and unfortunately, uh, especially if the doctor passes away, with a lack of lease separating the business from the practice, the valuations become muddled. You know, using the same credit card to fix the roof as you are to buy a handpiece can create all sorts of unintended consequences, uh, as well as, hey, I own my building. How, how should I be paying myself rent? Or, you know what, Bob, gosh, maybe I'll just wait 10 years until I've got a buyer and then sort of all figure this out. But at that point, the financials are usually pretty muddled. Um, in addition, we'll ta start talking about, again, one of the lowest hanging fruits is, uh, is how to negotiate or renegotiate your office leases. Again, for those of you dialing in, uh, great to see some of my, uh, my, my, my cell phone. I still got the 310, so great to see some people on the West Coast dialing in on the drive home. Um, a little bit about us, Sirius Consulting Group, pretty unique. We're the only healthcare specialized tenant an advisory firm of a kind in North America. This is it. This is all we do. Proud partner of Shines for the past 10 years on the business side of dentistry as part of their practice services division. Uh, we've now done over 13,000 dental office lease negotiations here. Uh, and that's pretty unique because we've been 29 years in the business. So very hyper specialized. We've got uh, attorneys on staff doing dental deals all day, every day. Uh, some of our team from a business background, one of them has been with us now for 20 years. We just celebrated his 20th year anniversary being a lease negotiator with us, which is he's done over 2000 himself personally. Uh, also, we've, we've gone to the dark side. We pulled some that used to work for some of the national landlords to now represent the doctor instead of negotiating against the doctor through the, pro through the process. So uh, a few components before we get to Bob. One of the first most importance are the importance of the lease. And this is a question we get all day, every day, which is, you know, where does it really fit in? And should I buy or should I lease? Uh, and this was some great questions Bob and I did on our course last year, which was really about, number one, um, you know, obviously buying the building. Everybody can make money in real estate as long as they live long enough. Uh, but it can take a large upfront investment. You obviously become your own landlord. There's some rental income, uh, depending on how you've structured it. You obviously get some flexibility and you've got the freedom because no one's there to tell you what to do with your building. Uh, with that being said, right, a lot of the practices, uh, especially the younger clinicians, uh, can, with all the debt you have, it can be pretty daunting to go into a new market, build out a new practice for a million bucks, and then on top of that, buy the building as well. At that point, you're as pot committed as it gets. So most prefer the ground floor retail, lots of natural light strip plaza, where there's, you know, you don't have to worry about being your own landlord or dealing with asbestos or dealing with all sorts of other challenges. So um, also interesting, a lot of the multi-sites from the big guys to the small guys, many of which don't own their own real estate, 
many of which are in the arbitrage game, right? Basically, you know, being able to sell two for more than they could uh, two together, then two separately, and then three, and then four, and then five. And the larger multiples of earnings, typically the larger the clinic. So uh, a lot of doctors getting into the multi-site side much prefer the ability to take that one extra dollar and instead of buying the building, go out and buy another or build another practice. So uh, from that perspective, in either case, it overlaps the same and the dental office lease becomes critical for both. So a couple of key questions here, and this is what we did with the uh, doctors who would pay 20,000, fly into West Allis, Wisconsin, and uh, Bob and I would sort of chat a little bit about some of these workshops. So I pared this down, but really give yourself on a blank sheet of paper, uh, a little bit of a sort of state of your estate. So ask yourself a couple of questions and Bob will dig in a little further in his section. But again, who owns your building today? Is it yourself? Is it your spouse? Is it a, a realty corp, right? Who owns it? And then your practice, right? Have you incorporated your practice, right? Do you own your practice personally, right? And number three is then another good question is, are you paying yourself rent today? And when I ask that to a lot of clients, they sort of say, well, sort of, or, ah, you know, what, whatever my mortgage is, that's what I'm paying, or man, I wait till the end of the year. And then I sort of, you know, do a quick little transfer at the end of the year. That can cause, uh, again, some other unintended consequences. But the other things to start thinking about, again, for those of you that own your own building, how are you tracking those expenses? And are you using the same credit card to buy cotton rolls as you are to fix the roof or fix the plumbing type of thing, right? And then again, how do you really differentiate those? Or as we look forward, what happens if you want to sell them separately, right? For those of you that do own, Right. How many of you are thinking of maintaining the building as a passive form of income upon your retirement and just selling the practice and continuing to then become a full-time landlord and keep that rental income as a good passive form of, uh, of income? If so, right, so important that a lease is set up to clearly delineate who's responsible for what. And again, most importantly, is look at it through the eyes of the buyer. I can't tell you how many you know, doctors reach out to us, get a review, uh, or we set up the lease just before they're looking to sell. Well, of course, that's going to be, if the ink is still wet when the buyer is looking at the lease and the financials, you're suddenly charging them 30, 40, 50% more than what you were charging yourself, right? When you were running the practice and now you're looking to sell it and having them pay that much more, uh, again, put yourself in the eyes of the buyer, major red flag. So again, give yourself a quick rating of the state of your estate. For those of you that lease, uh, roughly uh, three quarters of you, these are the key things. Grab grab your phone, right? Don't worry about my five and my two-year-old going nuts. Uh, but you know, when does your lease expire? Should be one function to keep directly in your phone with alerts, reminders, et cetera. And then the second one is, do you have any options to renew? If so, when is that option to renew deadline? Typically, it can be anywhere from three, six, or 12 months prior to your expiry. And what so few doctors don't realize is that, oh, sure, Bob, I've got another you know, three, five-year renewal terms. But if you fail, and I guarantee the landlord's not going to remind you, if you fail to send them that registered letter 12 months prior to your lease expiry, those three remaining five-year options have just become null and void. So talk about impact to profitability, right? Now, suddenly the landlord could easily increase 5, 10, 15, 20 plus percent because you've missed your option. Right. So that's the next one to put in your phone. So number three is what's your what's your transition plan? Right. What guidance have you had from your CPA to help mitigate the tax event? Right. And what's your plan? Do you plan to sell to an associate? Do you plan to sell to uh, a corporate entity? Right. Do you plan to just sell your charts? Right. Uh, and sell your leasehold separately. Right. What's your plan? Uh, 
Another great one is, are your options, right? What these days, Bank of America, many other partners we work with, if there's insufficient term on the lease, that becomes a big issue with the underwriters to try to get a loan approved for your buyer. So, you know, one big thing to demystify for many of you looking to transition, the roughly 27%, right? Realize that going month to month is just about as risky as you can get because the landlord can wake up tomorrow and terminate, and so can you. But again, it's what is your buyer purchasing from you, right? In reality, it's the it's the cash flow. Right, it's the goodwill, it's the revenue, it's the continuity of predictability of revenue. That as soon as they buy it from you for 1.5 million dollars, they're going to want to know that those patients are going to come through and they can service their expenses and debt. So again, are those options transferable? Can your buyer? Does your buyer have enough term to stay there without getting worried about getting kicked out? I won't ask for a show of hands or a questionnaire, but are you liable? Is there, have you signed it personally, which could again have a significant impact to your, uh, your liability even after you've sold the clinic? Roughly 92% of leases will hold the original guarantor and your corporate entity uh, personally liable and even continuing liable, continually liable even after you've assigned and transferred your, your lease. Um, and then the last piece is demolition and relocation. It's becoming all too common these days that landlords are inserting those in and some practice brokers are actually assessing a fee, a, a discount fee to the value of your practice of upwards of $300 per square foot if there is a risk that your buyer may be right forced out because they want to put up a big condo where your practice is. So again, for those of you that lease, you can rate your estate, the state of your estate. So as you're transition planning at a very high level, these are just seven of the core components that are you must be keenly aware of and have well structured to help ensure a very smooth transition. One is the assignment clause. Uh, for those of you that have dialed in, right, rental rates, base rents, financial terms, annual increases becomes a big one. We're seeing landlords asking for five. One the other day, Bob wanted a 6% annual increase every year for the next 10 years. Uh, consideration language, landlords looking for a percentage of practice sale proceeds. Uh, one doctor recently had reached out to us to sell two of their clinics to a corporate entity. The landlord wanted to redevelop, required a check for $160,000 for the doctor to pay to the landlord purely for a single signature, transferring it from Dr. Smith over to Dental Inc. One little clause in the lease that allowed the landlord to collect a percentage of those practice sale proceeds. And the landlord didn't want it to go corporate. They wanted to redevelop. So they made the doctor pay for it. But to ensure that it didn't stop a $2.4 million sale, he paid it. So how do we help to protect profitability? It's to get these types of nightmare scenarios fixed and fixed proactively. Uh, things like a death and disability clause, mm -hmm. devastating, devastating components. So many we've seen, especially over the past three or four years, that the doctor has passed away and you know had to do the emergency exit, right? Which by the stats from Henry Schein's dental practice, a uh, dental um, uh, DPT team, dental practice transitions team, right? The emergency exit, if it doesn't sell within 90 days, it typically doesn't sell. Uh, if there's one takeaway, please make sure that you have a dental specific death and disability clause inserted into your next lease renewal negotiations. Because in essence, it's almost like a life insurance policy that doesn't cost you a penny. So without belaboring these, these are just a few of the dozens types of components to make sure that you're aware of and are properly structured within your lease. Goes without saying, right, seven profit drivers in your lease, you know, negotiating your base rent, negotiating annual increases. Uh, Cam, so many doctors are unaware that common area maintenance is negotiable. 
right? There can be things excluded. You know, you might be paying 15% management fee to the landlord, which is, you know, five is maybe reasonable. 15% is nuts. Uh, fixturing period, free rent period, right? Look how much you're spending $10,000 a month, increasing it three or 4% per year for the next 10 plus years. You've got yourself a multi-million dollar financial commitment, right? Look at it no different as if you're, you know, writing Bob a check for a million dollars, wouldn't you want to make sure that your lease is absolutely at least fair with dental specific language? So just a couple of components there. Good news, Bob and I are going to go through all of these 52 specific negotiable clauses within your lease. And even though Bob's been fighting a cold all week, this is just, we're going to spend all night doing it. I'm kidding. Uh, with that being said, these are just a few of the many components to be aware of with what's in your lease agreement, or more importantly, for those of you that own your own building, these are the type of things that become can, can become quite contentious when you sell your practice and maintain the building as a form of income. So one practical example here this evening is the assignment provision. This is found in over 75% of dental leases. Have a quick moment for those of you that aren't dialed in. We've got well over 100 people here this evening. Thank you. Uh, have a quick read through here and try to pull out where, if any, are any red flags. Great to see some friendly names. So at this stage, when Bob and I are together in person doing the lecture, one of the first questions is, is who enjoys reading leases? And no one does, sort of like the tax returns, right, Bob? So what was the first thing we found? Well, as you can see here in blue, in this case, you cannot sell your practice without the landlord's prior written consent, full stop, right? And this is incredibly um, frequent and common. And in addition to that, right, look at this. So the landlord shall, just for asking to sell, the landlord shall have the option to approve the tenant's request to assign the lease or sublet the premises, and that could even be bringing in a 1099 uh, associate. In addition to that, they could say no, right? No, we don't like the cut of you know Dr. Smith's jib. Or number three, just for asking to sell, they can terminate the lease agreement on the day that your practice was due to close. You get far too much control. Imagine you get the practice brokers, you agree on price, you do all the tax planning, and at the 11th hour, the landlord says no. And not only no, but actually I'm gonna terminate the lease and I'm gonna go directly to the buyer because I can get another 20% right, per month on my rent by, right? How much is your practice worth without the keys? In addition to that, right? The landlord can adjust the market rent. And we've seen a bunch of this lately where landlords are trying to recoup costs, they will either increase it to market price or 15%, whatever is greater than the current rent the seller is paying today. And this is the consideration language I touched before, touched on before, right? This is the types of language where the landlord can in essence say that if you're getting any money from the assignment of that, that is owed to the landlord, right? And not, from your blood, sweat, and tears over the last 30, 40 years, right? And last but not least, which some of you, the last thing you want at the end of your careers is to suddenly have this clause, which states that regardless, notwithstanding the landlord's consent to any form of assignment or subletting, the tenant shall not be released from its obligations and shall remain personally and continually liable for any failure, lack of rent, or any of the performance of the entire lease. So most of you may be shocked to realize that even after you've sold, retired, and enjoyed retirement, you can still be on the hook financially as much as you are so today. And in Michigan, there was a doctor that stood up in the back of one of my, my colleagues' CE courses, and the doctor said, look, I was retired in Florida. This exact thing happened to me where my, the doctor I sold to, 
had defaulted, right? It was four months behind in rent. The doctor got the phone call enjoying retirement that not only was he responsible for the back rent, but he was also responsible for the remaining four and a half years left on the lease. So talk about profitability uh, sucks. What a great way to protect yourself by helping to restructure, completely rewrite this uh, again so it's properly structured around your eventual transition. This one little clause, easily a quarter to three quarters of a million dollars worth of liability. A personal client of mine, 74 years of age in Northern California, she was forced to pick up and relocate because her landlord refused to allow her to transfer her lease, right? We were able to negotiate her uh, a new location, roughly 10 minutes north. We got the landlord to cover all the build out costs. It was a, a just a, a great feel good story in the end. But can you imagine being 74 years of age and being forced to relocate your practice? On that note, how do we win? Well, this is what they teach landlords, which is the clock. The fastest way a landlord can increase their profitability without a penny of additional expense is to not do nothing but nothing, right? Ignore Bob's phone calls, delay as long as possible, right? And wait as long as possible as before your lease comes up for expiry. And then, of course, what are you going to do? There's no way you can pick up and relocate a practice in less than a year. So the landlord knows this. So the, every minute that they can stall or delay, right, the more expense, the higher they can increase rent and your options become extremely limited. Uh, so some strategies. This is one thing that, uh, you know, certainly as part of Henry Schein's practice services, uh, we really stride on as to how do we win? Uh, you know, great individuals such as Phil Cassis joining us this evening, uh, really looking at all of the different types of solutions. One thing, particularly for the lease process, is to, again, doing your homework, following a process that works. So number one is get all the documentation, no different than your taxes side, making sure that you have your original lease, a signed version from you and your landlord, a full digital copy of any addendums, riders, exhibits, and whatever lease that you bought or absorbed when you bought the practice, how many years ago from 1986, that could still be the governing document today that you might not even be aware of when you purchased it. Uh, number number two, figure out your long-term goals, right? What does your transition look like, right? What is your exit strategy, right? What do you want to accomplish in the short term? What sort of revenue? What sort of different procedures? Do you want to bring in associates? All of those are material as it pertains to the lease. Uh, number three, have your lease professionally reviewed. If you haven't had someone go through it for a second opinion or otherwise, I can't stress it enough. It's worth its weight in gold. Uh, number four is do your research, right? If you haven't looked at your demographics, rental rates, vacancies, comp reports, we have access to all of that. We'll have a quick little poll here for those of you that are curious what your rental rates have done now. Happy to email you over a copy and, uh, and compare that to your lease. And then number five, last but not least, right? Help to figure out what that carefully choreographed game of chess is going to look like as the lease negotiation twists and turns. Uh, meaning, right, what's your end game? What are your must-haves in terms of your lease? What are your nice-to-haves? And last but not least, what are some things you're willing to give up in order to help accomplish some of those must-haves? The ability to sell, right? Removal of personal guarantee, removing of continuing liability, right? The not having to return it to pre-dental condition, removing relocation, demolition provisions, all of those type of things. So that's steps one through five. What I don't want you to do is pick up the phone tomorrow, call the landlord and say, my God, I just watched Bob and Eric and what's my new lease going to look like, right? Don't skip those steps because you've just played right into the landlord's hands. At that point, then negotiate the financial, then the business components, and don't stop until you get a countersigned version to the landlord. So as I pass it to Bob to really help us save on as much yeah. of our taxes as necessary, because God knows we've paid too much. Let's make sure we're taking, uh, we're not getting taken advantage of in terms of the lease negotiations going. Uh, there's a quick poll. Again, if you want rental rates, uh, any sort of demographics, comp reports, we waive the fee for all attendees of this evening's webinar. And from that perspective, 
uh, gives us the opportunity to make sure that you're aware of the red flags, you've got a negotiation treatment plan on how to handle some of these core components, uh, and also to be keenly aware of all of your critical dates. Uh, and then again, even if you're just curious in terms of, hey, what are my local rental rates? Is it $37 now? Is it $42 a square foot? Uh, if for those of you that own your own real estate, uh, again, great to set up a call personally or one of the senior members of my team uh, and just walk you through the pros, the cons, uh, some of the challenges that can in, be involved with setting up some of these components and making sure that it's aligned with the rest of your financial team. So again, happy to spend some time personally pro bono. Uh, to help to make sure that you've got a, a very consistent and solid understanding of your lease situation today. Perfect. On that note, it is my pleasure as we approach the half hour. Uh, again, Bob Gray, one of the top dental CPAs on the planet, let alone the US. Uh, we're in for a, a, a great treat. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for joining us and I'll pass it to you, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. Thanks for everybody for joining here tonight. We're going to switch gears and talk about taxes now tonight, a little topic near and dear to my heart. Um, I'd like to make sure that everyone gets a chance tonight to ask questions as well. So we're going to try to make certain we leave some time at the end here. So feel free to make, to make sure you've asked questions because you've got an opportunity here for a free accountant tonight and you can't beat free. We'd like to customize this and make sure that everybody gets as much out of tonight as they possibly can. And I see already in the questions, which we'll touch on, one of you, Dr. M, just had a 35% increase in CAM charges this year. Ooh. So sorry to hear that. That is negotiable. There can be CAM caps and a whole bunch of other components we'll touch on afterwards. So of course, I do need to say tonight that Henry Schein Corporation is not actually offering any tax advice. It's uh, my words tonight. And we always recommend that you really listen to your own advisors. They know you best. I am Bob Gray. I'm really proud to be one of the founding members of the Academy of Dental CPAs. Uh, I'm also instructor of the ADCPA Business of Dentistry courses. Pre-pandemic, they were held throughout the Caribbean, even in Hawaii. And we hope to restart those again. If there's interest, we're going to stay tuned to this channel. We'll see if there's more of those coming up. Uh, Eric and I are both instructors at the Henry Shines Dental Business Institute, and, and both of us do a lot of lectures all around the, the United States. So I feel very qualified to help talk about this here tonight. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, though, is who am I? You know, I really am actually a big wino. My wife and I love going to Napa, as Eric might have pointed out, chasing those elusive 100-point boutique wines. When I'm not doing that, I like to drive my uh, Cadillac CTS-V that's modified to be a little over 900 horsepower. So for any crazy car enthusiasts, uh, that car is a lot of fun to drive. Let's go back to the ADCPA though. I hope everyone's heard of the ADCPA. Uh, it's a group of accountants all across the United States that um, really do focus on dentistry. To be a member here, you have to not just happen to have you know, some dentists as clients. You have to actually be in the dental space. You have to either be an instructor. You have to write articles. You've got to do things that, again, that keep you involved in the dental world. And, you know, you also want to make sure that you really understand what dentists do. The ADCPA has practices all over the United States. So if you're looking for one, you can go to adcpa.org and find one near you. Or you can always call me. We have clients all over the United States. People ask all the time, so what's the difference between, you know, a generalist, the general CPA, and, you know, a dental CPA? But I would tell you that if you really get down into the weeds and talk about how to maximize dental profits, you really have to know mesial from distal and buckle from lingual to really help a dentist get down in the weeds and figure out how to maximize that profit. So I would say if your current accountant can't point to tooth number eight, find one who can. That's the 80 CPA. On a little bit of what I want to talk about tonight. And a lot of these things I mentioned are born out of the mistakes that we see an awful lot of clients may do. I do a lot of tax return reviews for, for incoming clients who want to or, you know, potentially be considered as clients for our practice. We do complimentary reviews for those people. And I see just constantly the number of things here that, that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, one of the biggest things is just, did I pick the right entity? 
Um, should I be an LLC or a C corp or an S corp or whatever? You know, the C corps are things of the past. I mean, there's really no reason for any, almost anyone to consider being a C corp these days. For it would be a rare, rare case where that would be the best option. But many times I see people who start out as S corporations when they should have been LLCs or vice versa. So again, make sure that you understand what the benefits are of those different entities, and that you want, you you have the right one. You could start as an LLC. And as your income increases, go to an S corporation. That's more typically the way to go. But again, you, to talk to your advisor and find out if you've got the right one. The QBI deduction, that we're going to talk a lot more in depth about that tonight, the qualified business income deduction. We're going to talk, show you some examples on how to maximize that and make sure that you're taking the best benefit possible from that. I want to talk a lot, too, about the Section 179 or, or the bonus depreciation. There's a misconception, I think, across the board that if I buy new equipment, the very best thing I can do is just write it all off immediately the first year that I bought it. You know, why not if I can take that tax deduction? But I want to show you that that's not always the best thing to do. You, there's a, many, many times when not taking that deduction immediately would actually save you more in overall tax dollars than if you spread it out over time when your income was in a higher bracket. So... We'll, we'll talk again, we'll show an example of that. Also, with a number of people that I see that have the wrong pension plan. You know, if you as a young doctor, when you're starting out, uh, you can have a, what's called the simple IRA plan. Those simple plans this year, though, have a $15,500 maximum voluntary contribution to the, to the simple plan for the doctor themselves. Um, and again, for the younger doctor, that, that might be the right size shoe, it might fit. Um, but too many people start with that plan, continue with that plan, and now I see them in their mid-50s and they still have a plan where they're putting away, you know, fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year, and they're not meeting their retirement goals. And you have to realize that those, you know, you can go anywhere from a $6,000 IRA up to over $200,000 per doctor as tax-deductible contributions, depending on the plans or combination of plans that you pick. So just each year, it's worthwhile to ask yourself, do I have the right plan that will actually maximize my tax deductions and meet my retirement goals for investing? We'll talk really quickly about itemizing deductions as well. You know, they raised the standard deduction this in the last few years tremendously. You know, it's over $25,000 for married couples, and that's basically a deduction you get if you don't have any charitable contributions, if you don't have mortgage interest, if you don't have any of those things. Um, so you, many people have to look and say, well, should I plan my expenses? If I do have some itemized deductions, maybe I should bundle those things. Maybe I should consider the possibility of if I'm going to give to a charity, maybe I'll give them this December coming up for what I was going to give them this year, but I might also pull into when next January or, or 2024's contributions and say, if I made them all in December this year and then skip 2024, I might actually get a bigger tax deduction for that because I'll break over that standard you know, deduction level. So just make sure you're looking at that when you look at your itemized deductions. We're going to talk about some other planning tips and some rental issues as we go on here tonight. Let me start with... Um, well, start here. There you go. I want to talk about the qualified business income deduction. Um, the QBI was something that was born several years ago, and I still see a lot of people that either don't understand or don't really take advantage of it the way they should. The QBI was basically a business income deduction, meaning that it's not for people who take W-2s. It's not for employees. It's strictly for business owners. And so, so that's sole proprietorships, partnerships, S corporations. Uh, a C corporation would never qualify for the QBI deduction because the only way a doctor gets paid from a C corp is a W-2. The problem is that, so now you'd say, well, okay, if, if I'm gonna have a 20% QBI deduction, I wanna not be a, an S corp, right? Because gosh, the S corp, I'm still required as an S corporation to take some normal and reasonable wages. And so it, give me an example. Let's say there's a doctor that has an S corporation and they have, pick anything, 300,000 of net income. Um, if they were an LLC and the doctor was married, they'd be able to take a full QBI deduction on that entire 300,000. 
If they're an S corp and they're required to take at least say 100,000 in W-2, it's only the 200,000 remaining that's eligible for that QBI deduction. So again, I'm gonna show you an example that we're gonna combine this with the section 179, but I just wanna make sure that people really are looking at the, the practice as a whole and saying, you know, 20% of your income, the opportunity just to ignore it this is a pretty big deal. So make sure that you're actually taking advantage of it if you qualify. One of the problems is that for, for lucky for dentists who make a lot of money, once your family, if you're married and family income taxable goes over $460,000, you phase out of the ability to take this deduction, uh, about $230,000 if you're single. So it depends on where your income level is. If you're above that four hundred and sixty thousand, then you would want to be an S corporation because you're not you don't care about that QBI deduction. So again, that's when we talk about the importance of balancing this QBI deduction and entity selection as we go. I just want to point out that the PPP loan forgiveness had no impact on that QBI, and as time went on in the past, but most of you have all passed that point. Um, when we talk about Section 179 and bonus depreciation, Section 179 of the IRS code is basically the section that says, look, if I, I know that if I buy equipment, I'm supposed to depreciate it over its useful life. And the IRS publishes tables that talk about all the different equipment and what the, that rule would be. But Section 179 just says, well, as a tax benefit, we're going to let you take it as a tax deduction all in the year in which it was purchased. In order to keep big corporations from doing that, they limit the Section 179 purchases to 1.16 million this year. Um, so that'll certainly keep Tesla and some other big companies away from Section 179. And you cannot spend more than 2.89 million in total new equipment purchases in 2023, or that will tap you out as well. Um, there's also a thing called bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation is basically the same thing in which they said that you can, uh, basically for 2022, you can take 100% of purchases. For 2023, it's dropped down to 80% of the value of your purchases can be immediately tax deducted. Um, the, the, the difference between these two things really comes back down to the state that you live in. There are many states that never adopted Section 179 and so they may have still have a limit of say twenty or twenty five thousand dollars, regardless of whether you took a one point one million dollar federal tax deduction. You have to go back on your state tax return and erase all that and pay you know, state income tax on a much smaller number. Um, however, some of those same states that denied Section one seventy nine said, "Okay, we're going to adopt bonus depreciation and follow the IRS on that." So think of these two things from a federal standpoint as being almost interchangeable. Um, the, you know, if you're over 2.8 million in purchases, you would want to go with the bonus depreciation, but again, follow your state taxes, because that's really going to be the deciding factor as to which one of the two you elect. I want to talk a little bit about also about the, the placed in service. I mean, this comes up all the time. People say, well, Bob, I, 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 we're down to December now at the end of the year, and I really want to buy that new whatever, um, and, you know, but I, they've now I've, I put my order in December 1st and they told me that it might not be here until January 15th. Can I still tax deduct it if I write the check this year? Well, <clears throat> let me tell you, the uh, this is a little like going 55 miles an hour or 56 miles an hour in a 55 zone. People do it a lot, but I want you to tell you the right answer. In order for equipment to be eligible for Section 179, it not only had to be paid for, but it had to be on the in the in the building plugged in and available for use it didn't have to actually be used I mean, it could actually just have to be at 4 30 on you know december 31st it got plugged in unboxed ready to go and that makes it eligible but it can't be delivered in january the reality is i think uh, the problem is that a number of times the irs is saying listen what well, if i would went through an audit and i had a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment that i took a deduction for one year and they found out that it really wasn't delivered till 10 days later, they would have to go through and charge you on that 100,000, but then turn around and give you a, a, a $100,000 tax deduction on the next year's tax return. A lot of IRS agents don't wanna go through all that paperwork just to jumble between years. And so again, it doesn't make it right, but I just want you to know the correct answer is it has to be 
on the floor ready to go and placed in service to be technically eligible for Section 179 or bonus depreciation. But again, watch which state you're, you're in that makes the big difference. Here's a combined example. And I think if nothing else tonight, I really want everyone to pay attention to this because this, if you, if you walk away with the understanding of why this worked so well, you'll have a much better idea of the, the, how the 179 bonus depreciation and the QBI can potentially work together. As I mentioned that the, the, the income limits phase out for dentists, the joint uh, limit it ends at 464,200 and for single it's 232,100. So let's go through the example in the, in the center column here where it says without section 179. Let's say the doctor had $470,000 of practice net income and only a few itemized deductions and therefore the taxable income was $441,000. The federal tax was $103,000. In this particular example, because the doctor's income was too high, the AGI was over the 470, would not be eligible for the QBI deduction. But look what happens if you bought $150,000 worth of equipment that year and you did elect to take section 179. Now the practice income drops to 320. Your actual taxable income is down below the limit. So you're in, you're in good shape you would actually pick up a $64,000 tax deduction. That's on top of the $150,000 deduction you got for buying the $150,000 worth of equipment. This is an extra $64,000, I'm gonna call it phantom tax deduction called QBI, that just because you were clever enough to get your income within those parameters and limits, you're now eligible for a $64,000 tax deduction you weren't eligible for in the center column. And that makes an amazing difference. Look at $61,301 the very first year in federal tax savings, just because you bought $150,000 worth of equipment. So from a cash flow perspective, for a lot of people who are interested in you know, new technology or things like this, look at what that would do for your cash flow in terms of, you know, your people worry about production when I'm, if I'm adopting new technologies and I have a learning curve, how long is it going to take me to get up to speed? Um, so I would tell you that, you know, if you get a $60,000 boost in the first year in your, in your cash flow, it's a lot easier to adopt those kind of new technologies. QBI is complicated. I just really, really want you to understand tonight that just don't forget it's a 20% it's a potential deduction. So just plan for it accordingly. In this example, again, it was a $64,000 deduction that they got for free without writing a check. That's a pretty sweet deal. We talked about the different entities. I just wanted to show you a quick example here about how it really does impact. Let's say you did these same two practices. One, they both have 900,000 in collections. 600,000 in overhead and 300,000 for the doctor. But in the center column here where it says LLC, the doctor is eligible for the entire 20% QBI deduction on the entire $300,000. On the right-hand column for the S corporation, because the doctor was forced to take $180,000 salary to take a reasonable and normal salary per the IRS, the QBI deduction was dropped down from $60,000 to $24,000. And even though there's some, some Medicare tax savings for the S corporation, you can see that the net improvement is still clearly in favor of being an LLC in this particular example. This doctor would not want to be an S corp. They would want to be an LLC. So again, choose the right entity because it does have an impact on the outcome. In the example of the 179, I want to point out too that it was also that was a sole proprietor, but we S Corps and C Corps can also benefit. It doesn't really make any difference what entity that you are. Either one of those can work. Let me switch gears and talk a little bit about practice expansion. I know a number of you are said mentioned tonight you're thinking about that. Um, one of the things that people forget about is the this ability to have a huge tax deduction potentially if you're moving from one leased space to another. Let's say that you started back in 2013 and you did $300,000 worth of leasehold improvements to the building that you went into and you had it all fixed up the way you wanted it. If you did not do a cost segregation study, which we'll talk about, you'd have to depreciate that over 39 years. 
So now fast forward to 2023 and you think, well, I've outgrown the space. I want to move. I want to expand. What people forget is that you're now going to get a $215,000 tax deduction all at once in the year you move for abandoning those leasehold improvements. And that can be a huge incentive in terms of the cash flow and the, the tax savings to think about making that move. It makes it much more affordable to think about investing and, and moving up in terms of that. So don't forget that your leasehold improvements that are not currently tax deducted could be immediately tax deducted if you move. Talked about cost segregation. I, wanna, I call it how to turn studs and drywall into section 179 expenses. And again, remember section 179 is supposed to be like dental equipment, furniture, that sort of thing. It's not talked about real estate, but there's a way, way to do this, the IRS code. So many years ago, the IRS lost a court case. It was Health Corporation of America um, sued the IRS because they said, look, our, our hospitals, if we build a hospital, it's not going to be here. All the carpeting, the ceiling tiles, all these components of the building are not going to be here 39 years from now. It's foolish for us to depreciate it over those long time periods. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick our own. And they won. The courts actually said, well, that is kind of ridiculous. Carpeting is not going to last 39 years. The IRS, in, as a result of that, came up with a whole series of rules and regulations on how this has to happen. But I just want you to understand tonight that if nothing else, Breaking a building down into its components just takes things away from that 39 year. And you see in the left hand column, I said it's a million dollar building be 25,000, basically a year for 40 years. It's 30. They say it's 39, but you have to take a half a year the first year and a half the, the last year. So it takes 40 years to depreciate a full building without a cost segregation study. With a cost segregation study. A very conservative number in a dental business, 20% of the cost of that building winds up as five-year property, which is the equivalent of dental equipment. Even 1% in things like curbs and sidewalks and, and, and land improvements and other things that would be clearly deductible. In this particular example, though, that would result in an $80,000 tax savings in the first five years. And when did you need the tax deductions the most, right? It was when I just had a huge lump in my throat because I took a big, big mortgage and built a multi-million dollar building. That's when you want those tax deductions, right, to, to help make that affordable. The, actually, the analysis, there's a lot of numbers on here, but I just want you to look again at this, this the, the green box at the top here where you see that the uh, the million dollars is broken down into pieces versus the yellow box where it's all $1 million all in the 39-year column. And these calculations and these analyses we can get done for free by several of the engineering firms that do these cost segregation studies. So it, it, there's no cost to you to find out what it might be. I also want to point out that it's not just uh, people that own their own building. You could do, in this example, $500,000 of tenant improvements where you, you know, you're renting the space, but you have to do all the improvements to it. It's a cold, dark shell or whatever they you would refer to it as. That same thing would apply because you're putting all those improvements into that building. Many of those things, in this case, even higher ratio could be put into five-year property called dental equipment. You say, well, how does that happen? Um, I'm gonna, I'll show you in a minute, but Again, if, if nothing else tonight, when you think cost segregation study, look at these two boxes and say, I want the green box. I want my building broken down into pieces. They say, well, how does this happen? I say, you know, this, I ask people, so what do you think this is? Well, okay, it looks like an outlet to me, right? Well, the answer is no, it depends on what's plugged into it. Because if it's a fax machine, then this outlet becomes a fax machine. And all the wiring that goes all the way back to the breaker and all the, the, the fees and everything associated with having that building portion of that component built. This could turn into like a $380 immediate section 179 tax deduction for one outlet. Same thing as this. This is just a, a sconce. It's decorative. So would this be 39 years? No, that would be something that would be immediately potentially tax deductible. And all the infrastructure that's in your building, all the plumbing, all the wiring, all of that stuff that goes into a dental building becomes dental equipment. And so that's why all of a sudden all that you know, building cost uh, turns into dental equipment. What doesn't qualify are the actual load-bearing walls. 
And then land never qualifies. So that's there's no tax deduction for land. But when you think about the infrastructure and the, the electrical and plumbing and all the things that go into a dental office, it's very significant. So you wind up with a very big tax deduction by moving those components away from 39 years and moving them down into a, a shorter life span. The last thing I want to point out is that there's these, it's important to understand that these cost segregation studies don't have to be done in the year that you built the building or did the fit out. You could wait a year or two and then pull back all that depreciation because maybe the year that you built the building, you all bought a lot of equipment. So you had a lot of plenty of tax deductions for that year. You didn't need the deductions. So wait and do it in year two or year three post you know, building. Um, because when people say, I, I'll, hear, I'll hear a doctor say, well, I didn't pay any tax at all last year because I, you know, I built my building or whatever. And I think that's really kind of a waste because taxes are on sale when they're 12%. You can see in the column to the left there that the tax rates start at 10%. But a married individual can have in taxable income up to 81000 And the first 20 was only taxed to 10%. And the next up to 81000 was only taxed at 12%. I think taxes are on sale at that point. I think what you really want to do is make sure that you don't use tax deductions to get yourself down to zero at that point, because you only saved 10 or 12% on those tax deductions. When you look ahead, you can say, oh, I could be saving 35 or 37% using those tax deductions if I waited and I planned it properly. So again, just make sure you understand that it is possible to turn studs and drywall into dental equipment. I wanted to talk, leave some time for questions tonight, but it's important just to make sure you, tax planning is complicated. I mean, make sure you're spending time with your advisors, making sure that all this is, is planned out ahead of time and that you're not waiting to April when it's time to file a tax return to, to sit down and talk about these concepts. Choose the right entity. Don't automatically think you're gonna take accelerated depreciation. And yes, remember cost segregation studies. I want to leave time tonight for questions because I think if a lot of you have if have anything you want to raise your hand and point out tonight, I'm happy here to take a few questions for while we're on tonight. Thank you, Bob. I, I learn something every time from these. And as a building a business owner, certainly uh, every dollar that goes out to taxes hurts. Uh, just a couple of questions here, Bob, uh, that are starting to flow through. Again, Q and A is open for everybody. Uh, Dr. B said, is it wrong to be a C-Corp if that is how we have been structured for years now? Uh, the answer is a 90% chance yes, because a C-Corp could just elect. It's a simple one-page form. A C-Corp could elect to be treated as an S-Corp. Uh, again, without you don't change your federal ID number, you don't do anything else other than now suddenly get the benefit of saving all those Medicare taxes. And so it's unlikely for any doctor listening tonight that a C-Corp would still be the right thing to do. Um, different question. Dr. H had the question of sort of follow up. Can you change your entity from year to year? Um, the, the answer is no, you cannot flip flop back and forth. But what you can do is if you start out as an LLC, that's a, what they call a disregarded entity. So that we, we're taking the maximum QBI deduction there. As your income grows, you could then elect to become an S Corp. But that's a one way, one time swap. You still don't have to change your federal ID number. You don't have to recredential and all that sort of thing. But um, that's, that's a one time you can make that change. Perfect. So uh, one question we had earlier, this was the Dr. M who had a 35% increase in CAMTAR this year over year. Wow. So I would just suggest to those of you on the line, those triple net fees can be significant, but they are negotiable. So just a few things to remember is that there can be things such as a pulmonary maintenance cap. So it can't exceed more than X percent per year, number one. Number two is, right, there can be exclusions. What is deemed reasonable versus non-reasonable? Uh, Dr. M, feel free to email us. I'm happy to send you. I, I wrote a, a full article on sort of what's reasonable, non-reasonable, and how to renegotiate those components uh, as we look forward. 
Um, one, another question, Bob, a little outside of the realm, but um, what would a good retirement plan for a practice with one dentist, four employees, and can you suggest a good 401k administrator? Does that fall under your umbrella, Bob? Certainly. Yeah. I mean, if you, my email address is up here. So if you shoot me an email address and ask some questions, I'll be happy to make some referrals. But again, the answer to the question, what's the best pension plan for a doctor with four employees has to be answered by what are your goals? Because if you had a very you know, lucrative practice and you're, you don't have enough money put away for retirement and you want to put away 100000 then that would dictate a certain plan. If cash flow won't permit that and a smaller contribution, maybe a 401k or a smaller plan would work. So again, it's, it's, it's very specific to that doctor's goals. Great. And we have a celebrity on this evening, Bob, who has some kudos for you. The one and only Mr. Alan Schiff. President ah, of the ADCPA. President of the ADCPA. Welcome, Alan. Welcome tonight. Yes. <laughs> Please tell yeah, Bob Bob Royal, royalties in the house. <laughs> I'm proud of him and his knowledge. So thank you very much, Mr. Schiff. Um, Bob has been very gracious with his time. Now he's been up since four o'clock, uh, but on the uh, there's a, a final exit poll. And uh, Bob, did you want to touch on that? Not only will we do a complimentary lease review, but also, Bob, for the first time, you're actually now uh, willing to help people in terms of if they're looking for a second opinion regarding uh, their 2021 or 2022 tax returns. Yeah, so what I'd like to do for anybody that's interested in listening tonight is if you, you've got my email address, you can see my phone number on the screen there. Um, we're going to offer to do a complimentary review of a prior, leaf, prior filed tax return so that we can take a look and see if I, we think there's opportunities that you may have missed. We do this as an as an instructor in the Dental Business Institute. I've offered this to students for years, and I'm just always unfortunately shocked by the number of things that I see that have been overlooked or just opportunities missed. And so if you think that we could possibly help you or you're just interested, here's the worst case. It doesn't cost anything, and you might find out you have the best accountant in the whole planet. And we can't find even one little thing to make a recommendation about, so good for you. But if you're interested, contact us. And like I said, we would be happy to do a review of the tax return. Uh, this is not a you know an exhaustive practice review. It's basically just looking at the tax structure, looking at the kinds of deductions you're taking and making some recommendations. But for anybody who's interested, reach out to us. Currently 75%, Bob. So it's uh, great and roughly the same for a lease review as well. Um, quick follow-up question, Bob, Dr. C. I'm in the process of moving into a dental office where the owner is retiring. Uh, he sold his practice equipment and patient list to another dentist. He doesn't want to sell his building until at least three years down the road for tax purposes. I don't mind waiting three years to finalize the deal. We've already agreed to price. What's the best way to structure the lease to own agreement? We were thinking of three years of rent applied to the agreed upon price. Well, uh, from a lease perspective, again, it's devil's in the details, right? Is it a right to purchase an RTP? Is it a, a ROFR, a right of first refusal? Uh, it's keenly structured to try to understand exactly what the seller's tax objectives are. Uh, but more importantly, you want to make sure that you're protected, especially if, heaven forbid, you were to pass away in those first three years or become incapacitated, et cetera. Uh, so you do, uh, Dr. C, again, there's uh, the poll that's up there. Feel free to request a complimentary lease review. Uh, happy to look at what that looks like because you do wanna make sure that you're not shortchanged. And I've seen too many sort of right to purchase as a right of first refusal that you know, are there, but you know, the actual mechanics to get it done, incredibly unlikely. And you know, there's really not a lot of um, grit to them, if you will. So uh, Dr. C, yeah, feel free to reach out afterwards. Happy to discuss that specific situation. and. Uh, you know, again, from your perspective, maybe three years isn't the best time. Maybe you'd prefer a little longer, shorter, et cetera. Uh, so happy to, um, uh, happy to touch base with you. Uh, Mr. Schiff, thank you for joining. Um, so what do you recommend as an entity selection for a startup one doctor practice, Bob? What would you suggest in terms of Incorporation, a type of corporation. I believe that's the question for uh, yeah, I mean, clearly, 
yeah, clearly in 90% of the, the, the time, a doctor would want to be an LLC disregarded entity on their startup because that would be no limit to the tax deductions they could take. There'd be no limit to the QBI deduction. And it's unlikely uh, that, that their income, their taxable income would exceed that $460,000 right out of the box. Uh, certainly if it's possible, if you think you're, you know, you're buying a practice or doing something that might have more lucrative, it's possible. But again, 90% of the time, the answer is LLC uh, with as a disregarded entity. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, one one uh, interesting, Dr. S, about the QBI. Uh, how do you balance the QBI windfall in your LLC versus S Corp comparison and the ability to take bid advantage of retirement plan maximums? Yeah, that question does come up all the time because an S corporation doctor is on the one hand trying to take $290,000 of salary in order to maximize their pension contribution. On the other hand, the, the pension contribution uh, is, is limited if I drop my salary down to $100,000, if that's still reasonable. I would tell you that if you have to, it's a pretty simple math though. For most doctors pension plan, they really have a voluntary 401k and then a 4% match. Well, if you have a hundred thousand, let's say you took your salary from 180 to 280 or you're going back and forth. If you have a hundred thousand dollars with a salary and the choice option is to go to 280, but you get a $4,000 extra pension contribution, or leave it down at 180 and get a $20,000 tax deduction. I think most people would pick the tax deduction, right? It's not gonna, it's gonna be much better for you to lower your salary and take an enormous tax deduction than it would be typically to get a two, three or 4% match on your pension. If you're in a true profit sharing plan where it's a much higher number that again, again it's, it's not always the right answer, but for the vast majority of you, lower, lowering your salary still helps you economically. Great. Uh, another one about real estate and tax. Dr. A said, is it better for the tax return to buy the real estate beside the dental practice? What's the advantage of doing that? I'm assuming that would be perhaps the lot beside where the practice is located, I believe. Uh, Dr. A, feel free to follow up there. But in terms of land purchase or Perhaps he's thinking of building another location next to it. Any, anything about the purchasing land or real estate beside uh, the dental practice, Bob? Well, clearly, if it's, if it's a building that was actually, if it's a house next door to you and you want to think about the ability to, to grow in the future, maybe either tear it down or, or you know, take over that whole space for parking or in the back, whatever the case would be, then yes, I mean, you could actually take a tax deduction for renting it out while it's not being used as a dental office. And there would be de definite tax deductions for that. But again, for, for Dr. A, I would just say, send us a quick email address we, or email question. We can probably give you a better answer to that. Perfect. Uh, from an anonymous doctor, is incorporating with an S Corp okay? Again, if your income is below, your if your taxable income is below $460,000, uh, it's, it's not preferable. But if it's more than that, then yes, you would want you would want to be an S corp. Bob, one uh, one last one here, Doctor R. How can one find out about increasing retirement contributions? Part one. Part two is, and also how to switch from a, a simple IRA to Roth. Um, those again, those plans are so specific to the actual practice because it depends on the number of employees you have and things like that. I would say that there's no generic answer to that question. Um, if you again, you've got email addresses. If you try to shoot some questions out, we will try to help any doctors that are on on here tonight. Perfect. Well, Bob, I know again you've been up from four o'clock in the morning. Stephen is. Uh... Is that happy uh, time Stephen's, of year? Stephen's still on uh, UK time, but we cannot thank you enough, sir, for joining us this evening. Uh, it's all that's top of everyone's mind these days is taxes and tax filings. Uh, I learn something every single time. And uh, uh, Bob looks like 71% have uh, requested taking you up on your offer. So we, uh, we truly appreciate your time and, uh, and certainly helping out all our doctors weather the storm and uh, be as profitable as they can. All right. Thanks to all. Thank you. Stephen, uh, back to you.
Okay, thank you both so much. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Bob, for joining us tonight and for that informative presentation. Um, so good news, we did record tonight's webinar and we'll be mailing out the recording sometime during the next week. Um, we'd really appreciate your feedback via our survey that's going to pop up on your screen very shortly. So once again, thank you to all of you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again on future webinars. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.